Hello all, my name is Connor and I'm an educator here at Eastern State Penitentiary Historic Site. Thank you for joining us today on Facebook for this presentation on the first investigation in Eastern State's history written by my colleague Christine and myself. Today we will discuss the complex story of Eastern State Penitentiary's very first scandal in 1834 when an investigation into the prison was launched by a joint committee from the state legislature composed of state senators and representatives. This investigation was ignited by claims brought to Pennsylvania's Attorney General by employees of the penitentiary. Before we go any further, please note that the content and language of today's discussion is sensitive and potentially disturbing in nature as it relates to physical punishment and abuse. I will frame individual passages with a content warning, but know that this program might not be appropriate for younger learners. Through an examination of the report lit written by the Legislative Committee, we will explore the ways in which varying perspectives and voices both complicate and illuminate what happened in 1834. We will also explore several investigations into prisons today to understand how the prison investigation process has evolved since the 1830s and consider questions like, how are prisons held accountable for problems that go on inside the walls? And what does a prison investigation look like today? If at any time throughout the presentation, you have answers to these questions posed or questions about Eastern State, throw them in the comments section and I'll be more than happy to try to help answer them. When Eastern State Penitentiary opened in 1829, its founders and supporters considered the prison separate system, a system of complete solitary confinement for all prisoners as a groundbreaking and rehabilitative reform. Supporters had high expectations for the prison's founding correctional philosophy and for the prison's first warden, Samuel R. Wood. However, just five years after Eastern State Penitentiary opened, there were mounting concerns about prison mismanagement voiced within the Pennsylvania State Legislature. Specifically, concerns that wealth and family connections were about to sanctify fraud, immense and palpable peculation, meaning theft, and cruelty were within the prison walls. The legislature appointed a joint committee from the Senate and House in December of 1834 to be in charge of investigating the prison and drawing conclusions. Before the official 1834 investigation, an earlier informal inquiry began in 1833 when prison employees raised problems going on within the prison to Judge Charles Cox, who was president of the Board of Inspectors of Eastern State Penitentiary. Basically, those were the guys who were in charge of the big picture of the prison. The prison inspectors ultimately did nothing. And so several men brought the story to the Attorney General, George M. Dallas, urging him to ask the governor to order an investigation. So basically going from an internal prison investigation to now an external investigation be conducted by the state of Pennsylvania. Attorney General Dallas sent the following letter to Governor George Wolf, dated November 26. I believe it to be my duty to submit the subject to you that, if deemed necessary, measures may be taken alike to preserve this valuable institution in the esteem of our fellow citizens, to remove all doubts as to its system of discipline and general management, and if abuses really exist, to reform them before much mischief shall be produced. After hearing what um, Attorney General Dallas had to say, Governor Wolf officially brought charges to investigate Eastern State Penitentiary. The investigation involved an examination of 65 witnesses and hearings were held from December 1834 to January of 1835. Witnesses included prison administrators, employees, and prisoners themselves. The evidence introduced to the committee during the five weeks hearing connected five total charges brought against the prison. The first charge, licentious and immoral practices by prison officials. Charge number two, embezzlement and misapplication of public money and labor. Charge number three, cruel and unusual punishments inflicted on prisoners by order of the warden. Charge number four, practices such as late night parties on prison grounds. And finally, charge number five, favoritism shown for prisoners. 
Today, we'll be focusing specifically on this third charge of cruel and unusual punishment. I'm going to read the direct quote of the charge, but want to acknowledge that the language and description is disturbing to hear and graphic in nature. And it will be discussed several times in this section of the presentation. Cruel and unusual punishments inflicted by the order of the warden exemplified in the cases of Matthias McCumsey, in whose mouth an iron bar or gag was so forcibly fastened that his blood collected and suffused in his brain and he suddenly died upon treatment. Although prison physician, Dr. Franklin Bache had recorded McComsey's death as apoplexy, which is basically another term for having a stroke, the investigation's majority and minority reports ultimately revealed conflicting conclusions about what really happened to McComsey and whether or not the prison should have been held responsible for his death. Matthias McComsey was a 42-year-old African-American married laborer from Lancaster County when he arrived at the prison in 1831. On the day that he arrived, on the day that he died, June 27th, 1833, he was placed in the iron gag for talking to the man next to him. To date, no image of Matthias is known to exist. So what we see here are excerpts from the intake log on the day that he arrived to Eastern State and his entry in the death ledger at the bottom of the slide. According to testimony, the iron gag was used on him somewhat regularly. Prison keeper William Bain recalled, we gagged him 20 or 30 times and we had put it on him almost every week. A witness to McComsey's death, Leonard Flager, described it as a complete blind halter bit, about six inches long, about an inch square pallet in the center that goes on top of the tongue. It had two curb chains of iron to fasten behind his neck. Rings were there through which a chain was passed to fasten and then lock. An illustration of the iron gag shown here is based on the testimony from the minority report. This illustration calls for the use of the iron gag to be abolished, calling it an implement of torture. The investigating committee asked Warden Wood to produce the iron gag used on McComsey in December of 1834, but Wood was unable to produce it and brought a different one for examination. However, later the Attorney General was able to produce the gag used on McComsey for the committee's examination. Presently, we do not know what happened to the gag that was examined in this investigation. So once the investigation had concluded, they interviewed everyone they were going to interview in early 1835, the majority committee ruled and ultimately gave the prison a clean bill of health with a few mild reprimands and suggestions for reform. This majority report ultimately dismissed the charge of cruel and unusual punishment, finding that the gag was not an unusual punishment and had been approved by the prison. Also, according to the majority report, the iron gag was used in the United States Navy and had also been used at the Walnut Street Jail, a 1770s era Philadelphia prison that predated Eastern State. The report went on to conclude that although McComsey did in fact die of a stroke while in the gag, the application of the device was not connected to the event. Prison physician Dr. Franklin Bache did not consider the use of the gag improper, but suggested that the mode of attaching the instrument should be improved. The instrument and the device that's being referred to is the iron gag. However, not all the legislators agreed with the majority report, their biggest critic being Thomas McElwee, a member of the legislature from Bedford County. He assembled and published his own minority report which implied that aspects of what happened were actually concealed by the prison. He concluded that the gag was put on McComsey by order of the warden. He died by reason of the application. The punishment was unlawful and therefore he was murdered. At the center of McKelvey's charge, he is accusing Eastern State Penitentiary of murder. In his report for the minority, McElwee also had several drawings commissioned of common punishments during Eastern State's early days, including a restraining chair, a straitjacket, and an image of a man locked in the iron gag. So ultimately, what were the outcomes of the investigation? 
The president of the Board of Inspectors, Judge Cox, had resigned ahead of the investigation, denouncing the abuses that were going on within the prison and writing that I can no longer allow my name to be used to authenticate acts of the board nor consent to preside over its deliberations. Some prison employees accused some prison employees accused of prison mismanagement were fired. However, Warden Samuel Wood continued to serve as warden until 1840. In fact, when he retired, the prison's annual report stated that much praise is due to this gentleman for his judicious organization and arrangement of an important and united system of penitentiary punishment and for his humane and kind treatment of prisoners under his care. This scandal and investigation marked a crucial point in Eastern state history. It was highly publicized because both Thomas, both because Thomas McKelvey insisted that the investigation be made public and because the image of the iron gag, which was shown previously, was distributed throughout Philadelphia on a handbill or pamphlet. Uh, the 1834 investigation not only marred the prison's reputation as an institution for humanitarian reform, but also laid the groundwork for prison investigations going forward. So how does Eastern State's 1834 investigation shape our understanding of prison investigations today? Additionally, how does a contemporary lens shape our understanding of this historic prison investigation? Although not addressed in the official 1834 investigation report, it is important to raise the question of racial bias in the punishment and death of Matthias McComsey. How did an all white and predominantly male board of inspectors, prison administration, and state legislative committee impact the treatment of a black man? Matthias McComsey and the majority reports ultimate dismissal of the charges. We do not have historic data from Eastern State that examines the relationship between race and severe punishment at the prison during this period. However, we do have scholarship pointing to other aspects of institutional racism within the prison system during this 19th century period. Just as studies show that black men are incarcerated at disproportionate rates today, Studies of Eastern state incarceration data reveal that, according to historian Leslie Patrick Stamp, the percentage of African American men sentenced to Eastern state penitentiary always remained overrepresented related to the city and more strikingly to the state. Additionally, Eastern state was racially segregated until the early 1960s and employed an all white guard staff until 1956. This information makes me wonder how, you know, how did the existence of racist power structures within and outside the walls impact the treatment of prisoners of color throughout the prison's history? Recent prison investigations have revealed racial bias in the treatment of incarcerated people today. For example, in 2016, New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo ordered an investigation of racial bias in New York in New York prisons after the New York Times published an analysis of almost 60,000 disciplinary cases. The Times found that in prison, black people were 30% more likely to get a disciplinary ticket or punishment than white people. They were also 65% more likely to be sent to solitary confinement. Although Governor Cuomo responded to findings by stating that he would look to the inspector general to recommend reforms for immediate response uh, and immediate implementation, the Times confirmed that as of 2018, no findings or recommendations have been released. And currently, as of 2020, there are still no additional updates about these recommendations. Other recent investigations have uncovered violence, bad infrastructure, and mismanagement in prisons today. In 2020, the Justice Department launched a major investigation into prison conditions in Mississippi. In February, the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division officially announced an investigation into conditions in several Mississippi prisons after a series of deaths and episodes of violence occurred inside. According to NPR, the recent violence began after an uprising over the death of an incarcerated person occurred in Mississippi State Penitentiary, also known as Parchman Prison, in December of 2019. Between December and February, 15 people had died and 29 staff members had been assaulted. 
So how did conditions within these prisons reach the outside to help initiate this investigation? A series of images and videos were captured using contraband cell phones, revealing footage of fights, crumbling infrastructure, broken toilets, and rodent infestations. Additionally, a 23-page request developed by civil rights groups and state lawmakers was sent to federal officials, articulating problems such as understaffing, gang activity, and violence. In January, 29 incarcerated people filed lawsuits against state officials, and Governor Tate Reeves requested that the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation assign an officer to Parchman Prison. He also encouraged a group of prosecutors and law enforcement officials to find a replacement for the former state prison commissioner who had resigned in December. So concluding, how do you think prisons should be held accountable for problems that go on within their walls? At the beginning of this presentation, we examined Eastern State's 1834 investigation and the mechanisms in place for reviewing you know, general prison conditions and how according to, some Eastern, according to some Eastern State employees, the Board of Inspectors failed to address concerns during their informal inquiry. In order to confront these concerns, prison employees went above the Board of Inspectors to report to the Attorney General what they viewed as malpractice within the walls. If these people did not go outside of established internal systems, these alleged acts of corruption and cruelty might never have been illuminated. Along with the 1834 investigation, the New York and Mississippi prison investigations also highlight the varying ways in which investigations into prison conditions can be initiated and conducted. According to the American Bar Association, there are standards for internal reviews, such as internal or contracted auditing units who are responsible for investigating serious allegations of staff misconduct. This was the role of the Board of Inspectors at Eastern State in the 1830s. There are also standards for external reviews and investigations. External reviews include regular inspections and public reports of prisons by governmental agencies, uh, independent of each jurisdiction's prison. The Bar Association also states that governmental authorities should enact legislation to implement and fund compliance with these standards, and that legislative bodies should exercise vigorous oversight of corrections, including conducting regular hearings and visits. External reviews can also be done by non-governmental bodies, providing additional oversight and advocacy to support incarcerated people seeking justice. For example, here in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Prison Society has been conducting regular visits to prisons and speaking with incarcerated people about prison conditions since its founding in, 18, in 1787, when it was called the Philadelphia Society for Alleviating the Miseries of Public Prisons. This was actually the first non-governmental entity in the United States, which was granted legislative authority to go inside of prisons. On the one hand, the varying models of prison review and oversight through state legislative committees, the Department of Justice, prisoner lawsuits, law enforcement reviews, internal and external reviews might suggest a robust, comprehensive, and multi-layered system. On the other hand, however, once again, according to the American Bar Association, the United States is one of the only few Western countries without a comprehensive mechanism for the routine inspection and monitoring of all places of confinement. The assertion that there is no consistent and comprehensive method of oversights of all prisons and jails and detention centers raises big questions about accountability from, raises accountability in the US prison system. The United States has a sprawling network of diverse types of confinement, from state prisons to federal prisons, from juvenile detention centers to private prisons, from ICE facilities to psychiatric correctional facilities. You know, criminal justice in America is immensely complicated. On the following slides are a few maps of prison locations from various departments of corrections websites, which for me helps visualize the enormity of our criminal justice system and how there is not one uniform approach to presenting data on corrections. Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, 
California, Massachusetts, Alabama, Texas, and then finally a map of federal prisons in the United States. As a society, as citizens in a democracy, it's really up to us to decide how prisons should be reviewed and investigated. Many of our governmental officials responsible for investigation and reform are elected officials, and yet many times it takes incarcerated Americans or people on the outside to raise concerns to these officials. Additionally, voting rights are in many cases limited for Americans who are incarcerated or previously incarcerated. According to the National Conference of State Legislatures, in 21 states, people lose their voting rights during incarceration and for a period of time after, typically while on parole or probation. With election season quickly approaching, we must each decide what justice in America looks like, who is shaping these decisions and policies, and also who has the right to vote. As we close, let's reflect on these two questions. Who should hold prisons accountable? And what, will the and what will future prison investigations reveal about the treatment of the confined during this pandemic? I wanna thank you so much for stopping by Eastern State's Facebook page today. Be sure to stay tuned next week for the second installment of our investigation series, which will take a look at the 1897 investigation.